gold and silver will continue to do well overall, but there are going to be squiggles along the way. No bull market is a straight line. The environment for safe haven assets in general and gold and silver in particular is phenomenal. You know, we, we have inflation and we have incredibly easy money and we have multi-trillion dollar deficits going forward for as, they are, uh, as far as the eye can see. That, none of that is going to change. Um, so gold and silver will continue to do well overall, but there are going to be squiggles along the way. No bull market is a straight line. And... Um, I, I think just the finance, financial markets in general still have this idea that there's adult supervision out there and that there is a way to fix things if we just have the right people and the right policies. So the phase change in market psychology will come when people realize that it doesn't matter who's there. You know, we could have our George Washington or Abraham Lincoln in charge and, and it will not matter because there is no policy that fixes this much debt. You know, there, there's no magic interest rate or magic marginal tax rate or magic, um, um, uh, you know, healthcare policy or immigration policy. None of that is going to fix our financial problems because we owe way too much money. You know, it's a very simple calculus. And that is that when, when you owe more money than you can pay back, your life becomes uncontrollable. And we're there now, you know, and, and it's just a matter of the financial markets um, understanding it and then starting to act accordingly. And, uh, you know, it feels like they're, um, you know, the early stages of that are, are taking place now. But the big deal comes when the Fed when the Fed caves again here, you know, and I think three or four more days like this in the stock market is all it would take, you know, for them to cave and say, oh, did we say we were going to taper next year? And did we mention higher interest rates in, in 2022? Never mind, you know, we, we care about financial stability more than we care about inflation. And when they send that, market, uh, that message to the markets and they say so explicitly, which they're going to have to at some point, uh, then everything changes because then we're in an inflationary world. Everybody will have to agree that that's where we are. And, um, you know, people will start panic buying the stuff they might have bought two years from now because they don't know what the price is going to be in two years. And that'll push prices up even further in the short run, which causes more panic buying and so on. So, you know, that's the consumer side of things. And then on the financial side, who wants to own financial assets that pay you in a currency that is actively being devalued by its government at an accelerating rate? And the answer is nobody. You know, who wants a government bond yielding one and a half percent when inflation is going to be five, six, seven percent basically forever, if not much higher, you know, and, and that changes everything. And then we got to go back to the 1970s for some analogs, you know, when uh, inflation started to perk up and it didn't get crazy. Um, at first, uh, but it still made people suspicious of government bonds. And so long-term interest rates started going up. And then inflation went up even more and long-term interest rates went up even more until, you know, towards the end of the decade, you had uh, double-digit interest rates and double-digit inflation and gold and silver going straight up for the last two years of the decade. Um, probably something like that is coming, but that would just be the intermediate stage of what's coming now because um, we we're actually in pretty good financial shape back in the 70s. We could handle higher interest rates without blowing up. We can't do that now. So if interest rates start to go up, which by the way, they are too, you know, interest rates are actually rising the last couple of days as everything else um, gets volatile. Um, as interest rates go up, that raises the cost uh, for basically the leveraged speculators out there, which is to say anybody who bought a house with a mortgage in the last few years and anybody who's got stocks on margin and pretty much every hedge fund that is using leverage to do whatever it's doing, all of those guys blow up when their interest costs um, rise beyond a certain point. Um, and governments who have mostly financed themselves with short-term money because that's where rates are zero or negative um, will find that their interest costs are exploding when their rates, the rates at which they have to borrow, go positive and then start to rise into well into positive territory. And so government finances blow up too. That's all out there. And it won't take much from here. It just takes a continuation of this year's inflation rate for another couple of years. And that's, that's not really a tall order when you consider what's happening out there, you know, just the wage side of things. Um, workers are figuring out that they can ask for higher wages and that they can go on strike and they can win. Uh, and they are so underwater compared to where they should be. If, if we were in normal labor markets for the past 20 years, workers in the U.S. would be making twice what they're making now. 
So they've got a lot of ground to make up. And with their newfound confidence, a lot of them are going for it. So we're going to see much higher wages for sure. Uh, you know, barring a, an immediate um, recession from here, you know, if the stock market tanks and that pulls us into recession, all bets are off. But if we have what we have this year and it continues in our, another couple of years, you'll see double digit wage increases, which the Fed considers to be real inflation, which will increase the pressure on the Fed to do something. And if they don't do anything, that's the signal, you know, that they'll never do anything because if they're not going to try and uh, restrain double digit wage growth, then there's really nothing out there that's going to cause them to raise interest rates. So very interesting few years coming. And, um, you know, with the 1970s as our, you know, intermediate term analog, a very dramatic couple of years. Definitely. And it seems kind of ironic, I guess, as we see this inflation raging, we see the dollar index rising. So it's like, well, what is happening there? That's one of the fascinating parts of this story is that, um, see, normally, in economics 101, you say if rising and in, if inflation is rising, that makes the currency less valuable by definition, right? That's what inflation is. So you wouldn't want to own that currency or you wouldn't want to own it at last year's exchange rate. Uh, but this, for the first time in history, is a global inflation. Everybody's making the same stupid mistakes with their currencies that we're making with ours. So when inflation picks up around the world, it's perceived to be more of a problem for other countries than it is for us, which makes the dollar relatively attractive <laughs> compared to the euro and to most emerging market currencies. So uh, let's look at why that is. If you're Brazil or Chile or somebody like that, um, you have a big proportion of your population who's just getting by, um, which means that uh, by the time they get done paying for gas for their car uh, and food and rent, they don't have any money left over. So let inflation pick up in a country like that. And, and you're forcing people to decide which of those three things, gas, food, and rent, they're not going to pay this month. In other words, their, their life is pushed over the edge very possibly. And they're likely to take to the streets. You know, you get civil unrest when something like that happens, and then you get regime change. Um, so this is a much bigger deal for emerging markets than it is here, which means those currencies are way less attractive now. You know, the uh, um, Argentine peso or something like that. Forget it. You don't want to own that. You want to own dollars um, if you have a choice between those two things. Now, over in Europe, um, they screwed up the pandemic. Well, I don't want to say they screwed up the pandemic thing. I think the pandemic thing was just never a fixable problem in, in the terms that we were using. So what happened was they, um, you know, besides the ongoing financial mistakes that they were making. They, uh, they locked everybody down and, uh, and thought they were ahead of it, thought the pandemic was going to be over this year. And then they went off lockdown and then, you know, cases came back. And so they're going back to these really draconian lockdowns and people are taking to the streets. You see these, by the way, this is very underreported in the U.S. It seems like a bigger story uh, than, it's, than you would think by watching CNN. But you've got these crowds to the horizon in Rome um, who are demanding an end to, um, you know, forced vaccinations and lockdowns and things like that. And you've got um, Dutch people fighting with the police in the street. What, how bad do things have to be before the Dutch go to war with their cops? You know, that's just something that you would never expect to see. And yet we're seeing it out there. And you have to go to YouTube to see the videos because we, um, the American press isn't showing it. But um, Europe it, oh, and then Germany is losing Angela Merkel now and has to form a new government. And who knows what that's going to be? Uh, in France, it looks very possibly like Marine Le Pen might win the next election. And she's an anti-Euro conservative. So um, the, the background problems of the Eurozone are now being replaced by some front burner stuff that's very serious. So Again, you know, who wants euros if you can hold dollars? Because the U.S. just have the has these relatively minor problems. We you know we have big problems, but uh, they're relatively minor compared to the immediate stuff that's going on in so many other countries. And then you've got China with the uh, the Evergrande thing, where their real estate market is kind of imploding. You know, and what does that mean? Where you know they're a very highly leveraged real estate economy, much more so than the U.S. Um, so that's a big deal, you know? So we look positively pa uh, placid compared to a lot of these other places, but we're not. I mean, we're heading for that same financial cliff that everybody else is. It's just that maybe we're we're going marginally more slowly than some of these other countries, and that makes the dollar look relatively good. But it isn't good. You know, you, you don't want to own 
a major fiat currency in this world. And the dollar is the major fiat currency. So uh, I, I think the dollar's strength relative to other currencies might go on for a while, but its actual strength in terms of buying power uh, is headed nowhere but down now. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn 500,000, 1 million dollar, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, Here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.